welcome to each one of you for the Justice V R Krishna Iyer Memorial Lecture on the theme "In Search of Being Right: Citizens, Governance, and Courts." To begin with, I invite Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, founding Vice Chancellor, O. P. Jindal Global University, to please share the welcome address. I am so delighted to welcome all of you to this very, very special moment. All right, all I can think of is uh, what uh, Paulo Coelho said that uh, when you want something, the entire world will conspire to make it happen. Uh, a couple of hours ago, we began facing this challenge, and for the last two hours, it has been rather tense moments. But uh, we are so delighted that we have been able to overcome what we saw to be an impending challenge. But I am so delighted that we are here, and we will indeed have this extraordinary day when we'll be celebrating the life and contributions of Honorable Mr. Justice V. R. Krishnaya. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this uh, Justice V. R. Krishnaya Memorial Lecture. We have with us very distinguished uh, jurists. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Honorable Mr. Justice C. T. Ravi Kumar, Judge of the Supreme Court of India, who has just arrived. Thank you very much, sir, for your presence. We are also expecting Honorable Mr. Justice K. V. Vishwanathan, uh, Judge of the Supreme Court of India, who will also be joining us shortly. He is, uh, as we speak, in another program uh, at the Supreme Court, and he should be here shortly. Um, I want to take this moment to thank Mr. R. Venkatramani, the Attorney General for India, for having accepted our invitation to deliver the Honorable Mr. Justice V. R. Krishnayar Memorial Lecture on the theme, and I quote, in search of being right, citizens, governance, and courts. Now, the reason this uh, moment is very special is that uh, today we have an extraordinary conglomeration of lawyers, judges, academics, and also educationists, and many other individuals representing different walks of life, ambassadors, people who represent civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, intergovernmental organizations, think tanks, research institutions, and of course, some of our very distinguished alumni of our own university and our faculty members. I want to take this moment to extend a very warm welcome. Um, I also want to particularly thank uh, Mrs. Vijay Lakshmi Venkataramani for opening her home and indeed her heart for us to be here and as we celebrate Justice V. R. Krishnayar and his contributions. I don't intend to talk much about Justice Krishnayar, but all I can say is that he is somebody who inspired generations of lawyers, law students, judges, including me. Uh, we were very fortunate at our university for a number of reasons, and I want to begin a very short story of our university by essentially referring to the life and contributions and how he got connected to us. All right. So, Justice V. R. Krishna here has been part of our uh, journey from the very beginning. Way back in March 2008, when I had just returned to India in January 2008, uh, our Chancellor and then benefactor, Mr. Naveen Jindal, had accepted to make the contribution to build the university. We were in the formative phase of acquiring land and essentially working towards building a university and a campus. And at that time, in the month of March, I wrote an email to Justice Krishnayar requesting him to send a quote, uh, send a message uh, for this uh, journey that we are about to undertake. And in his typical style, I spoke to him. I called him up at around 11 a.m., sent the email. And then at around 2, he called me back and asked me in his typical tone, Rajkumar, have you checked your email? And I said, I haven't, sir. And then I checked the email and I got this message from him. And I quote, the OP Jindal Global University and the Jindal Global Law School are an institutional twin of terrestrial glory, sky high and sea deep in jurisdiction and jurisprudence. A cosmic wonder of learning and wisdom in every dimension and an expanding universe of erudition embracing in its rich plurality the art of living and science of being. Entire humanity is its comprehensive constituency. Search for truth 
in its limitless infinity and exalted excellence are its supreme ambition. May this tryst with divine noesis be fulfilled in the sublime century of ever escalating achievements. Law and life will reach their finest hour when this great goal gains profound locomotion through this unique university, March 2008. Now, March 2008, we were barely acquiring land and essentially beginning to develop the idea of this university. There were no sight of students, faculty or staff and that was the formative phase in which we began. Let me quickly tell you about our journey. Just in 2010, a year after we started our journey, when Justice Krishnaya was 95 years old, he visited our campus and delivered one of the most beautiful lectures. He spoke for 90 minutes, planted a tree and inspired the first batch of students and of course faculty and staff who were present there. His erudition, his commitment, his dedication, his passion, his intellectual integrity, all of which was so strong that those words even today echoes in our ears as we think about him and reflect about him. All right, the journey of our university has brought us to where we are today. We began in a very modest manner with only 100 students and 20 faculty members and a 49-acre campus and 100,000 square feet of built-up space in the year 2009. And today, we have over 12,000 students, nearly 4,000 faculty members and staff from 50 countries and over 100 acres and 4 million square feet of built-up space. This journey brought us to where we are with 12 schools in law, business, international affairs, public policy, liberal arts and humanities, journalism and communication, art and architecture, banking and finance, environment and sustainability, psychology and counseling, languages and literature, and public health and human development. We were very fortunate at so many levels at the founding itself. I had the privilege to meet with the then law minister, Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj, who in turn introduced me to an Indian benefactor named Naveen Jindal, and I met him for the first time in, on October 31st, 2006, and that one year led him to do three things. One, to make a substantial financial commitment. Second, to do it in a not-for-profit manner. And third, to let us have the academic freedom and autonomy and independence to build a world-class university in India. This journey that brought us to where we are today is also means that our institution has become larger. We are connected with the world. We have international collaborations with over 400 universities spread across 75 countries in the world and our partnerships spread across the world and there is not a single part of the world with whom we don't collaborate. Our faculty members come from over 50 countries and our students come from over 70 countries. We are a very interdisciplinary university and that's something that the national education policy has spoken about now when it got released in the year 2020 but since our founding we are interdisciplinary. Our commitment to research and institutional building is reflected in our publication record and our faculty members are at the vanguard of publishing and producing first-rate scholarship. This journey that has brought us where we are today has also resulted us in we being recognized by international rankings and one of the rankings is what will be released today. But more importantly, we have also been recognized as an institution of eminence by the government of India. As some of you know in the education world, the Ministry of Education led by the Minister but also the Honorable Prime Minister of India made a major public policy announcement five years ago with a view to identifying public and private universities to give them the status of an institution of eminence. That process led to identifying of eight public universities and four private universities to give the status of IOE and we are one among them. As I end my short presentation, I want to quickly say that we are looking at a future. Our 10-year strategic plan is to expand ourselves into a university with more comprehensive academic programs. We intend to start a school of engineering and technology, a school of artificial intelligence and robotics, a school of data sciences, a school of natural sciences, a school of biotechnology and biomolecular sciences, a school of medicine, a school of dentistry, a school of nursing, a school of physiotherapy, as well as a school of pharmacy and allied sciences. Our goal is to become a more comprehensive university as we look at 2034 and our strategic plan. As I end my presentation, for those of you who haven't been to the campus, 
I invite you to our campus, which several of our friends and judges here who are present, lawyers including, have come to our campus. I want you to come and experience the Jindal Global University. This is our new faculty office block, which houses over 1,000 plus faculty members, an interdisciplinary and collaborative space for learning and uh, reading. Uh, that's our, one of our new uh, uh, dining blocks as well. As I said, we are a fully residential university and that means our faculty and students live on campus and that's part of our effort to build a world-class infrastructure. I want to quickly show what we are doing in, the, in this year. We are expanding the campus and we're building a state-of-the-art sports complex, but more importantly, we are creating a state-of-the-art moot court academy. This moot court will be hosting over 1,000 people, including uh, an opportunity for engaging in trial advocacy, but also arbitration, dispute resolution, mediation, conciliation, all those things will be part of this new block that we are building. We also will be housing a 1,000-seater conference room, which will also be part of an effort to build an intellectually vibrant environment. I want to end by saying that so many of us have had the opportunity to create something in our own lives. We have been able to do what we have done through OP Jindal Global University because of the philanthropic initiative of Benefactor, but also the extraordinary contribution of so many individuals, many of whom who are present here. I recall the words of Justice V. R. Krishna here when he believed in our vision long before the world did. I also want to express my deepest gratitude to our Attorney General for believing in our vision and supporting us again long before the world discovered us. With those words, I want to end here and say that it is an absolute pleasure for us to host all of you here uh, for this lecture. And let me formally extend a warm welcome and invite Mr. R. Venkata Ramani, the Attorney General for India, for India to deliver the Justice V. R. Krishnayar Memorial Lecture on the theme, In Search of Being Right, Citizens, Governance and Courts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. Um, I invite Honorable Mr. Justice C.T. Ravi Kumar, Judge, Supreme Court of India, to please share his reflections. He has an appointment to attend to, and he will be sharing his reflections now. It's not a uh, good evening to all. It's not because of any appointment. My frame of mind, it's something different today. My elder brother, on whose labs I grew, more than 10 years older than me, is now in the ICU. But still, this great man, this great man, when we are uh, gathering in this function, we have already decided to do so, I think I should come and uh, say a few words. So sorry, sir, it's your turn virtually. You are gracious enough to permit me to. On my way in here, I was wondering that uh, much like the gentle and the soothing breeze and drizzle gracing us today, Justice Krishnaya's presence was a coming and benevolent force, enriching the lives of all who had the privilege to know him, learn from him. Unfortunately, though I can relate, I never had an occasion to have a, an individual meeting with him. Of course, I had seen him many, so many times, heard about him, learned about him, and from his mouth also, I heard. As we know that uh, I share the same state as Justice Krishnaya, so, much. so I must tell you an interesting fact about his life. Justice Krishnaya's house was named Sadgamaya by him, the meaning of the same being virtuous or implying only good things will come. His contributions to our Indian jurisprudence are a living testament to the fact that for a fact only good things have come out of that. 
Sadgamaya, that was a place where so many greats, great persons, renowned persons, they were there, always discussing only what good things, what good we can do to the common people. And as we reflect on uh, Justice Krishnaya's life and legacy, let us remember his own words, justice is not an abstract of concept, but a living reality that must touch the lives of every individual. That was he, and he always did, other. And this always reflected in his judgments, in his speeches. Our fraternity must strive to uphold his vision of a more just and equitable society where everyone, every person is treated with dignity and respect. My recent reminiscences on cases in front of me at the Supreme Court have always made me dip deep to find and pinpoint the intention of Justice Krishnaya, who ushered in the era of bail being the rule and jail being the suggestion. Undoubtedly, the insights are not lost on us, but unfortunately what surely is lost is the real intention of that. Indulge me for a few moments where I wish to throw light on the judgments titled State of Rajasthan versus Balchant, of course 1977 4 CC 308, where on paragraph 2 and 3 he authored to state that basic rule may perhaps be bail and not jail, but the application of mind by the judge cannot be done away with the factors like uh, gravity and heinousness of the offense involved. This itself was a very good uh, enough to tap into his thought process and draw our lessons, but he did us a favor and beautifully authored a later judgment that is Gudi Kanti versus Narsingh Halu and others versus uh, High Court of Andhra Pradesh. That is a 1978 1 SEC 246. In paragraph 7 of that, I quote, it is thus obvious that the nature of the and the charge is a vital factor and the nature of the evidence also is pertinent. The punishment to which a party may be liable if convicted or conviction is confirmed also bears upon the issue. Of course, I know that uh, everyone knows this. Uh, this is just like a brocade, jail. It is the exception, bail is the rule. But then, knowing Justice Krishnaya, a great reformer, a justice who always, throughout his life, was on the side of uh, the common people, are we think and understand that uh, he meant that always, irrespective of or unmindful of the gravity of the offense, always, it should be like that. Being a Kerlite who knows Justice Krishna here and his deeds and works for the common people, I will say an emphatic no. Because in his later judgment itself, he himself said, though this is the rule, the heinousness, that's a matter to be looked into. Because see, understand one thing, somebody who cheats the country or indulge in a very heinous crime. Are we to say that this is the rule? No, that great man never thought like that. I really wanted to say that if somebody is courting and while uh, arguing for bail, no, this is the rule. Of course he said it is. Normal circumstances, it should be that. But then that great man never intended, I know, because of that great person, he never intended that you must not think about, uh, suppose if he indulged in a crime which is against the, against the nation, still you should uh, follow this. No. I am sure, I think that uh, in this way also, you must understand and you must have some discussion whenever you are dealing with or saying about uh, the judgment of uh, Justice Krishna here. His vision, simply he ordered the judgments, of course, it is also an outcome of his great thoughts. But then, know that man and then interpret it. And I think that is our duty and we will have to take his mission and that should be our vision. Jai Hind.
Thank you so much, Honorable Justice Ravi Kumar, for sharing your reflections, and more importantly, for being here today in spite of a family emergency. I am so pleased to welcome Mr. R. Venkata Ramni, Attorney General of Our India, to deliver the Justice V. R. Krishna Iyer Memorial Lecture on the theme, In Search of Being Right, Citizens, Governess and Courts. I was wondering uh, when uh, what started as a gentle breeze became a little strong and uh, God Varuna began to shower his love and affection on each and one of us. How do we really whet the appetite of all those who are going to come here? I mean, am I going to whet their appetite beyond what God Varuna is going to do? And if he is going to do it, am I going to do it, do justice to Justice Krishnaya's lecture? I understand that God Varuna had at least partly heard my appeal to him, and sure he will continue to hear our appeals, and so that I will be able to whet your appetite. In the, in the course of this evening. When my very dear friend Rajkumar asked me where I could share my thoughts about Justice Krishna, yeah, we thought about several places, indoors, outdoors, Jindal, Sonipat, uh, Taj, many ideas came. And one day he said, why not at your place? I fell in for the trap. It's a, it's a lovely and affectionate trap. And here we are today. It's also interesting that in an open space like this, we are going to talk about an open society. And it comes so interestingly. I spent the couple of days, uh, probably more times in during night hours to get ready for this talk. Rajkumar suggested uh, three or four topics about 75 years of constitutional history and something about fundamental rights and so on and so forth. But then as you saw, Justice uh, Krishnaya's uh, statements about Jindal University, you could have picked up about the pursuit of truth and being in right and the cosmic university. So these thoughts came to my mind. I thought, let me talk about what Justice Krishna himself would have felt very deeply persuaded to talk about. That's how the, the talk for the subject for the day came to my mind. Before I request your attention. I know an extempore speech is always uh, appealing to both ears and mind, but um, in occasions like this when you are called upon not only to showcase your memory, but also to share some thoughts which are part of uh, chronicles, books, literature, elsewhere, and part of Justice Krishna's own speeches, I thought it's uh, proper that I prepare some speech. I'll I'll read out part of them and try to uh, kind of interlace my speech with some personal reflections. When Jess Krishna had turned 99, I remembered landing in Delhi in 1979 at uh, the benevolence of Professor Madhava Menon to practice in Supreme Court, who was my mentor, teacher, and benefactor. He ushered me one day in Justice Krishnaya's home, that was late 1979, and I still remember this Krishnaya sitting in his chamber with, you know, with a dhoti and, uh, you know, banyan, and his table full of papers, books, and whatnot. So for somebody, imagine 42, 3 years ago, a young, starry-eyed advocate coming from a faraway place like Pondicherry, landing in Supreme Court, looking at this huge domed building and what is in store for all that kind of thoughts. And look, Krishnaya, he looked too large for me. I remember that day. But then he became too close to me very soon thereafter. So after the retirement, uh, I can probably count any number of occasions 
events, uh, subjects uh, of great uh, interest uh, to just Krishna, where we worked together. Before I read something, I thought I'll have this recollection which give you the connection which we have, which is I most call a, one may call a spiritual connection beyond an intellectual connection. We travelled together to Chaibasa in 1992 and some human rights conference. We, I took care of his travel, stayed with him. We went to a remote uh, tribal village and he wanted to know about that village. So we went on an open jeep and he asked me to stop at a, at a small house. He said, uh, I would like to know who stayed there. He asked for the inmates. So a middle-aged woman came out and uh, so the people who are around us uh, trying to inform her who this person is. So of course, for somebody in a faraway village, how could she know anything about a judge of the Supreme Court, or somebody like Krishnaya? But in a few seconds, she understood that she is standing before somebody who is very noble. I, he sat on a charpai and began talking to her and asked her very affectionately. She said, I am doing my graduation and all that. So after coming back, he sent me a, he wrote an article about the visit to Chaibasa and he began the article like this, myself and my friend Venkatramani went to such and such a place. What a great, uh, you know, compliment to be said, I am a friend of Krishna Krishnaya. So these are many, many, many such occasions. So when he was laid to rest, uh, I was in Cochin and um, that was about completing his 100 years. So when he completed 99 years, there was uh, an event uh, in Cochin where I think the Jindal uh, Law School had organized that event. I wrote a small poetical piece about Judge Krishnaya. I thought let me start with that and end with another poetical piece which I wrote when he laid his body to rest. Let me start with that. This is a call from afar of humble make, of wishes strong and regards deep, though distance is long for a wishing leap. When minds unite in common themes and weave fabrics of dreams for a human wheel, all distances melt. And such melting pot your life has been. Those weak in power, your meanings made strong. Those crying in silence saw bridges with your visions. Law in your hands was alchemy of sorts, and justice in robes was a dictionary of mosaic parts. The constant search and the ceaseless thirst to see all humanity in equality walk and in dignity dance, your long march has Lilliputians like me to script stories of constitution for the poor and compassion towards all. This is what I wrote when he was 99. My respectful greeting to the honorable judges uh, who have been very graciously consented to be here today, part of the evening event uh, to celebrate a, a great a human being. And my greetings to all other dignitaries, my friends, my sisters, brothers, and as well, uh, probably, I think, good part of those over here are uh, Mr. Rajkumar's uh, invitees. And I think I contribute only to a very small part of those over here. Even so, I'm so great and so feel happy about it that and I could probably, when I walked into the house about a year and a half ago, uh, one could hardly visualize that sometime later about a person like the Krishnaya, we'll have an open society, you know, uh, dialogue like this. So I, I thank each and every one of you are here today, despite the threat in the skies and, uh, uh, and, and the forebodings in, in in the heavens. Now it will be an incomplete homage while remembering Justice Krishnaya. 
if I stop merely with anatomizing his judgments. He was fond of quoting Robert Frost often, who said, but I have promises to keep and miles before I go to sleep. His reflections on life, laws, social changes, the nation, the impoverished, and the great appeals of a nation's history are voluminous. His mind never rested. Offering solace to those in distress and fulfillment of aspirations and dignity of the weaker sections was his mental wear. Moments of pleasure or self-indulgence were never his pastime. In the theatre of his mind, there was no room or time for games that the elite class play. He tacitly endorsed the American economist Thorstein Veblen's views on consumption, conspicuous consumption, and his theory of the leisure class. In Sunil Batra, he pondered as under, I quote, and in an appeal to human tomorrow, if none responds to your call, walk alone, walk alone. Judicial power is a humane trust to drive the blade a little forward in your time and to feel that somewhere among those millions, you have left a little justice or happiness or prosperity, a sense of manliness or moral dignity a spring of patriotism, a dawn of intellectual enlightenment, or a stirring of duty where it did not exist before is enough." End quote. When my dear and esteemed friend Rajkumar asked me about what I may like to talk as I said earlier, the subject came to mind so spontaneously and like an innovating morning breeze. But then it became a challenge. I have spent several days and nights, as I said, in trying to capture and have endeavored to do justice to the ideas that can possibly be brought within the subject. I think Justice Iyer would have endorsed my thoughts in his own inevitable childlike effervescence and nobility and breadth of understanding. Justice Krishna Iyer is a lot too large a persona to be capsuled merely within the common genre of a great or famous judge. Judge Richard Posner, in his foreword, to the biography of Justice Henry Friendly writes thus, I quote, he had not had an exciting early life like Oliver Wendell Holmes or Byron White. He was not a character like Learned Hand or an enigma like Cardozo. He had not been involved in great political events like Brande, Frankfurter and Robert Jackson, I quote. I may venture to say that Justice Krishnaya he is much more than all of the above judges put together and a blend of a different amalgam. There are other great names who have transformed law and its relevance, and there are those who are drummers ahead of their times. A learned author epiloguing in a recent study of the European Court of Justice had the following to say about the Vice President of the European Court. It is certainly tempting to know, to borrow those words for Justice Iyer, and to say what, that the great harmonizing skills with Justice Iyer inevitably pressed into service at all times, in all, at all his career and public services, has been one of seminal causes for the fundamental transformation of the Supreme Court of India into a truly becoming people's court. I quote about what the European writer is about Justice Leonards. Leonards is a, <laughs> a truly great scholar. His problems where he is second to none and better than most, it is encyclopedic knowledge coupled with the most in in ingenious synthetic talent. Take any disparate group of cases in any area and put it through the uh, Leonard's will and an illuminating doctrinal map will emerge often with novel categories and a systemic narrative. Just as Krishnaya, I think, tells us through his life that the lines between law and justice and the political process will never be finally drawn and in, inflexibly written, but carefully moved. What prompted me to talk about the apparently philosophical subject I have chosen today, pursuit of truth and being in right, I suppose, are the noblest elements of our life, individually, collectively, socially, and institutionally. When both of them are choked 
by extreme co external coercion or a run a riot without self-imposed obligations, the temptation for adventurism, the scope for distrust, and the paths of debilitation of social cohesion can be the consequence. Limits of individual and institutional conduct have one common basis, namely, to be alive to the temptation of breaching the dikes, to borrow Justice Krishnaya's words. The dikes I am alluding to here is not mere separation of powers, but something more broader and deeper. Even good reasons for cloaking any power can extend to breaching the dikes. Just, just I uh, fundamentally thought, wrote and spoke about our call of dharma to be in the search of being in right. Writing about Bhagavad Gita, he says, speaking for myself as an advocate and a judge and later as a campaigner in election and as a fighter against injustice, I had landed in distress several times, especially in gray areas where the simple solutions is not simple and much may be said on both sides. Contemplation in tranquility, assessment impartially, action without evil motivation, and impartial, intelligent thought at the level of higher consciousness give you light." And quote. There is human, he said, to act right, to act right is an experiment with truth. The idea of an open society and the search for truth began occupying my mind over a long time, perhaps owing to my inclinations and my association with Justice Aya. My reading of totalitarian governance in the erstwhile and current socialist bloc on the one hand, and the open society of many other countries on the other hand, drove me to grasp the dialectics of employment of all power on individual minds, social fabric, and on the free pursuit of truth and being in right. The course correction principle and the politically correct idea coercively employed by totalitarian governments to keep people in tune with ideology and governments have set me to think and rethink about the powers and limits of ideologies in governing and managing our lives and conduct and the powers of institutions in doing so. These thoughts persuade me to understand that my pursuit of truth and being in right uh, must be on equal regard basis. And I must allow others to do so, not in the narrow vision of John Stuart Mill's words of liberty, but much beyond that. When it comes to courts and governance, it cannot be a running race with each other. All of us are prompted in our conduct to be in right, to know what is right, right course of action, and to be doing right is then is thus essential. No one may say that she would not mind being in wrong. But many of us being in wrong in many ways is a reality. We have, we have say enough and good reasons for being in wrong. Whenever we are asked to review our decisions, there is always a bag of reasons to resist to review. This, this, human, this human tendency is an important and unfathomable part of our brain architecture. It deeply pervades our daily life the evolution of criminal law towards more and more boundaries of justice is an aspect of this. I begin to think, think that the quest for being in right for reasons of utility, relevance, and justice too is wired into our brain dharma. Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, said that some features of how we perceive the world are given a priori, that is, without experience. Neuroscientists tell us that our sense, senses are not open to open walls to allow all stimuli into our brain. Our inability to see ultraviolet light is cited as an example. It is said that our brain does not merely register impressions, but changes and interprets them. If this is so about the physical world, what about the world of our life transactions? The selective role played by the brain is instrumental in our search for being right. The world of our experience, the world of living in a community, and the more expanding and diverse it becomes, the range of 
interpretations expand. The greater this expansion, the choices we make on interpretations can become both right and wrong. This applies to all human conduct, including functions as governance institutions or as courts. I consider that while we can be in wrong, the earnest search of being in right is what I may call the dharma of our mind and the satyagraha of our journey. The question to be asked is not merely why there is war, but why there is peace as a reason of a search for peace and why we need to know every moment of our life to untangle, to unentangle wrong from right. The book on evolutionary psychology, Homicide by Martin Daly and Mark Wilson, compares high rates of violent deaths in non-state societies with its decline in the Middle Ages in Europe. If the evolution of state as a political principle and as a constitutional idea, and further, as a high moral idea, can bring about this change, the intrinsic changes in the further evolution of the state as a high mediating platform and not as a coercive institution can be thought of as our collective quest for being in right. When it comes to courts, become, because enormous care is bestowed on being right, being in wrong is seen as an exception. The very idea of appellate review, how it is premised on someone below is in the institutional hierarchy is and can be wrong. And because someone is below in hierarchy. In equal status situations, however, the sheer number of appellate proceedings in all courts is all about the search for being in right. We dispute, we are in wrong, and that disputation is part of our freedoms. Human history is all about this. Being in right and wrong, and endeavoring to offer justification is our history, and maybe the graph of our journeys as homo sapiens. Injuring someone whom you may not like, killing those whom you hate, or those who stand in a way of thoughts and faiths will not be end us as being in right. We also practice lesser ways of disabling people whom we think as undesirable, or should not have a governing say in social affairs. Some ideologies may, by excessive interpretations, or faiths by disoriented intents, justify taking control of others' lives. I seek apologies for these few introductory observations, though they are quite long. While my reflections are related to the fundamentals of Justice Ayer's worldview, etched through his judgments, speeches, and writings, I may not confine myself to the analysis of his judgments. I propose to deeply touch upon four contemporary aspects which have connections to and relate to our innate propensity to be in the search of being right, namely, one, violence of mind and conduct, two, technology as an enabler and disabler of life, C, constitutional frameworks and ideas as a roadmaps and guidelines for individual and collective conduct, and C, D, the challenges in drawing lines and balances in, sustain in, a, in sustaining a stable social order. Hunting for food for sustenance demanded. Hunting for food for sustenance demanded alertness and exploration in uncharted physical areas and no rules to be obeyed. The search for being in right demands, however, navigating the four aspects of life today beyond the hunter level as we will be creating rules of higher orders both for navigation and being in navigation. We live in a world which is packed both with conflicts and communion of thoughts. While wars and aggressions have not faded away, their recourse and relevance are not endorsed. An encyclopedic work on violence and its decline by Steven Pinker provides good insights on how we can connect our mind and conduct to being in right, he says, I quote. The historical trajectory of violence affects not only how life is lived, but how it is understood. What could be more fundamental to our sense of meaning and purpose than a conception of whether the strivings of the human race over long stretches of time have left us better or worse off? How in particular 
Are we to make sense of modernity, of the erosion of family, tribe, tradition, and religion by the forces of individualism, cosmopolitanism, reason, and science? So much depends on how we understand the legacy of this transition, whether we see our world as a nightmare of crime, terrorism, genocide, and war, or as a period that, by the standards of history, is blessed by unprecedented levels of peaceful coexistence." And quote. Just Krishnaya would have willingly written a foreword to Steven Pinker's book and asked Jindal Law School to make it a textbook on liberty. From Nandini Satpati to Sunil Batra, from Prem Shankar Shukla to Maru Ram, just as Ayer transformed ordinary instances of seemingly and accepted daily affairs of police, prison, and criminal justice into matters of structured violences of mind and conduct and deplored them. The common thread connecting these cases was the liberty question. The famous biblical quote, quote, what is truth, asked Justin Pilate and would not wait for an answer, always troubled him. Is reflections on liberty of all human beings, particularly the poor and the weak, as non-negotiable in all inter in interactions and exchanges of people and governments found in Meneka Gandhi are too profound and original to yield to any higher restatements. He said, the divinity that dwells in every person must be afforded opportunity by state and society to manifest its infinite potentiality, science which the right to liberty and equality is but egregious baloney. By personal freedom, I mean the freedom of every law-abiding citizen to think what he will, probably today you would have said to think what she will, and, uh, and to go where she will, and on his lawful avocations with a later hindrance from any other person. Life is a terrestrial opportunity for unfolding personality, r rising to higher status, moving to fresh woods and reaching out to reality which makes our earthly journey a true fulfillment, not a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing but a, but a fine frenzy rolling between heaven and earth. The spirit of man is the root of Article 21. Absent liberty, other freedoms are frozen." Unquote. Elsewhere, just Krishnaya spoke of secularism. The basis of secularism is that in all civil matters, including what would be called family laws, common citizenship postulates common family law. Discrimination between the sexes based on religion also violates secularism. In the same vein, he talks about women's empowerment. He says the largest minority in the country, perhaps the weaker too, is Indian women. Whatever the religion, they have to be served by legislative social justice in the matter of family affairs. Thus, we reach a stage where Hindu, Islamic, and Christian court, more or less with similar provisions, may pave the way for a uniform court for all. That will be the finest hour of family jurisprudence in our land of div divisive religion and separate his family law and court. Are truth and rights complementary? How can I, without searching for truth or without confident about it, assert or affirm any claim as a right? If truths in the social sphere are unlike truths in science and can be more than one on the same subject or matter, like theories of crime, how do we go about in our search for doing the right thing in dealing with crime and punishment? Should rights trump truth or can discovery of truth in the social sphere happen as in the domains of science? As we move into more, more technology and market-driven societies, as we are not still able to turn our backs to war and aggression, intolerance and hatred, as global trade and other expansions began to wear as also hide the designs of hegemony. These questions are becoming important. This question is also important maybe not so much as to provide mathematical answers beyond refutation, but to alert us against both excesses and defaults. Neither individuals nor ideologies nor faiths are free from excesses or defaults. Only we try to minimize them if we are ethically strong or we tend to mitigate their effects by compensatory measures 
both moral instincts and law converge on this aspect. Morality and law are mutually reinforcing loops. Should we not therefore say that the search of truth and being in right by individuals are intimately connected to the same search by governance and both relate to the same search by courts? What is being right as a citizen, as a governance institution and as a court? For me, as an individual and citizen, I need to know that there are some rules to be obeyed in order that I am part of the peace and order in the community. Firstly, if I do not care to know them, I am in default at the threshold as a citizen, and I am not in search of being in right. This default makes me an anarchist or a rebel with no care for order, but to elevate me as a preacher of my truths alone, as a higher than anything else. Secondly, I should have the freedom to explore the truths about my life and the satisfying means of pursuing these truths. I should have, this will be my most important and constant motion in life. In this motion, I am in search of being right. However, we are born into a world which is already fashioned in certain ways. Religion, faith, social hierarchies, machines and technology, art and other cultural domains, including our towns and villages. They're all condition of our life. All of us try to find ourselves in the midst of all this. We try to secure solace and comfort by arranging our thoughts and conduct within these given realities. But we be persuaded by our innate strength of moral and ethical urges to challenge them or change them. This phenomenon of creative urge to change is also part of my being in, ser in search of being in right. But this motion is not without encounters with the rest of the world. The encounters of all of us with each other and the disagreements we generate in the process takes us to the next community level, namely multiplicity of truths and rights, and from there to governance and to courts. I must, however, say that our journey cannot end with generating disagreements, but must generate peace and solace. Your mind in turmoil or without peace or in wanton disregard of multiple truths and designs of life is like the urban waste landfill, potentially inflammable and ecologically hostile. Such minds which are anarchic are not in search of peace for all or ill-suited to be in public life. Democracies can be stymied by such minds. I wish to digress a little. Indian thoughts on human makeup talked about the elements of a body and mind, the karmendriyas and yanendriyas, the five doors of entrance of realities, and the five doors of exit. In the factory of our life, these are like employees. We are called upon to be witnesses of these in order that we cross the river of life without being drowned. Non-attachment to the elements of life is the pursuit of truth, the ultimate truth. I may pursue the spiritual truth or world truth like Buddha, Ramana Maharishi, or like Sufi mystics like Rumi. I may, by arriving at these truths, persuade others to be in search of being right. But how, as a social being, I can close my eyes to social realities of sufferings and pain, and which are products of social arrangements and also individual shortcomings. I say, just as I was keenly alive to the task of building bridges between these two realms of the world and life, while dialectical materialism showed him the way of grasping, one way of grasping social realities, he was not rest content with that. I remember an article written by him about Vivekananda comparing Marx and Vivekananda. I think every one of us should read that. And those of us who think that Krishnaya was closed only to dialectical materialism would probably revise their understanding of this great human being. Multiplicity of truths and rights in the social reality of our times. The Indian thought of Vasudeva Kudumpakam, or similar idea reflected in the Tamil Sangam literature, Purananuru, captured this possibility. But they need to be expanded by infusion of other thoughts. What is technology doing us to us today? What are we doing with technology? 
how does our search for being in right is enabled by technology or disrupted by it. We are moved into a realm, into a techno life matrix. All our activities are now techno driven. Economics and technology are now embryonically connected. Our faculties of mind are mortgaged to all the good, the great and the inevitable of technology as also the baneful, the baser human sides. It's difficult to imagine a brave new world where we can be in search of being right without external help. All talk about artificial intelligence, focused on its unimaginable contributions towards facilitating human engagement and work. In this dimension, none of us as individuals, governments and courts are masters of our free will. The gains and the losses are not clearly visible. I hope we will not surrender our innate human foundation of being in the search of right. Anything toxic to human mind was anathema to Justice Krishnaya. What about toxic social media where all decencies and deliberations are buried? Social media has become more of satanic versus than paradise regained. Many European thinkers have extolled the benefits of machines. Arnold Toynbee talked about machines taking over the mundane work of life. He says, the transfer of energy from a lower sphere of being or of action to a higher sphere. Five pathways to the future are outlined by Robert Sidelsky in his book, The Machine Age. I wish to note that third and the fifth dealt with by them, by him. The third is possible future in spiritual extinction called the dystopian thinking, as again the utopian thoughts. I quote Albert Axley's lecture in 1961 here. Quote, there will be in the next generation or so a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude and producing dictatorship without tears, so to speak, producing a kind of painless concentration camp for entry societies, so that people will in fact have their liberties taken, uh, taken away from them, but will rather enjoy it because th they will be distracted by, by any desire to rebel." Unquote. Dostoevsky, in his notes from underground, puts his narrator to say this, I quote, you want to cure men of their old habits and reform their will in accordance with science and good sense? But how do you do? How do you know not only that it is possible, but also desirable to reform man in that way? And what, and what leads you to the conclusion that man's inclinations need reforming? In short, how do you know that such a reformation will be benefit to a, to a man? if such may be the logic, but not the law of humanity." And quote. I wish only to quote Rajiv Malhotra in his book on artificial intelligence about, about, uh, and the artificial intelligence and the, and the future of power. He says, artificial intelligence plays a pivotal role in each of these disruptions and each of these battlegrounds has multiple players with competing interests and high stakes. One, battle, for economic development and jobs. Two, battle for power in the new world order. Three, battle for psychological control of desires and agency. Four, battle for the metaphysics of the self and its ethics. And five, battle for India's future. I think just Krishnaya would have probably found depths of understanding what the future is about to in the hands of governance courts and the people of India in these five important elements. It appears that every enlargement of a series of actions carry with them the inbuilt elements of policing and control. Information is now caught in a tug of war between the liberator and the gatekeeper. This is a challenge to democracy as well, to doing justice. The task of both being a liberator and gatekeeper, I would say, I would say is a common task for both governments and courts. The task of governance is also a journey in search of being in right. When I look at instances chronicle in the book, blunders of governments about the British government's law and policy making over a period, I find how governance can fail to be in the search of being right, or how it can close its eyes to be in, this, in, in such a search. In policy making, both big and small, we have reached 
a stage of intense competition between political parties. The Darwinian survival of the fittest seemed to have gripped all of them. All talk about federalism is entangled with this aspect. The freebie and the related economic policies dressed in high or well-dressed economic jargon are elbowing out sober and sustainable principles. Political rhetoric is not being in search for truth and being in right. Democracy needs deeper reflections on what can be right and what can be disruptive of being in right. Maybe we need an amalgam of ideas connecting freedom of innovation, freedom to generate, mul freedom to generate multitude of economic and other social resources for all and regulations which do not stifle freedom and, and freedom and equal regard for social conduct. I insist that only in equal regard social conduct by all of us can ultimately deliver. The convergence of individual governance, individual and governance conduct is imperative for all of us being in the search for the right. Neither pure left ideology nor free market principles are competent or equipped with the necessary answers for dealing with the intricate and manifold aspects of inequality and diversity. Let me catch few figures in this regard, particularly with reference to the COVID and pre and post COVID periods. I quote from a book. Also among the pandemic's effects has been a rapid unprecedented accumulation of, of uh, accumulation of to end wealth. The number of billionaires in the world has uh, quintupled over the past 20 years, but the jump in 2020 was the largest single increase in any year since Forbes began tracking billionaires' wealth. In one year, the number of billionaires in Forbes global list grew from 2095 to 2755. Their total net worth rose from more than 5 trillion or 61%. The United States and China saw the largest increase in the number of billionaires, but the percentage of GDP Russia saw the largest increase in billionaires' total weight. About conspiracies, and about conspiracies by market against public, Adam Smith is often quoted. It says, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion. But the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public, or in some contravenes to raise prices. That's how it seems to be today. The high and the rising level of income wealth and other inequalities of social bargaining power is said to be subverting democracy. Compared to studies of USA, Russia, China, Germany, throw some light on the political forces that can shape the institutional environment in which markets for labor and capital can coexist. The case of Germany tells us that market openings do not, do not have to lead to inequality of worrisome magnitude. The cases of USA and Russia are different. India does not belong to these examples. It stands on its own experiments. We can look at examples elsewhere in the world where the slip away from democracy has robbed people's ability to make sense of their lives and, and make sense of their freedom. Contemporary narrations about Russia, for instance, or say Iran, gives us glimpses of how what is being right can be nothing but what the dictates of the government are. The mounting, the mounting perception that is called the democracy is in retreat in many parts of the world, maybe only stories about transitions. Larry Diamond, an authority on democracy worldwide, is stated to have said that we've entered a period of democratic recession. I think that these statements need not necessarily relate to us. India is strong in a democratic roots. Though, we need to ensure that the right to protest, right to demand accountabilities, right to demand that our governments pursue truth and being in right and do not slip into narrow sectarianism are not stifled. The reach and impact of globalization may reach its new challenges very soon. Democracy within a country may not remain immune to these challenges. This domestic economic, political, social and other policies can no longer be local. I will try to probe how within a constitutional framework, without a slip away from democracy, citizens drive to be in search for being right and governance responsibility to be in search of being right can still collide and clash.
If you have to ask what is an important function of freedom, the answer can be making, someone, making sense of one's life. All of us try to make sense of our life. By being in search of being in right, we try to make sense. The more rational, compassionate and accommodative is our search, the less the scope for being in right. Making mistakes is part of making sense. The, into the tolerance about mistakes is also about making sense. Without, without tolerance, freedoms can be in peril. Contracts which, led to in which land in courts are in a way mistakes in making some sense of being right about loss and gain. Domestic disputes are also mistakes in people trying to make sense of their lives. On the contrary, hate speeches are not mistakes but disregard for being in right. So also, market corporate corruption is more or less contempt for any search for being in right. Not caring for dignity of women is also away from being in right. Not caring for lives of children who are trafficked, not caring for promotion of or striving for excellence in educational institutions but converting them into more ideological dense and many more are examples. We can enumerate many such instances. These are deliberate conduct with no element of inner questioning on the need to be in search of being right. There are a few contrary examples on which probably it'll take a lot of time for me to engage on your mind. Just as I have probably had in mind some pathologies in the political process in our country under the umbrella of democracy. When governance is keen to be in search for truth and for being in right, pathologies in the political process will have no place. So it is that we say the search for being in right by individuals, as also for governance, is like carrying a burning candle or a lamp and keeping it alive in the midst of winds from all directions. Two framework, there is a burgeoning literature on the sweep and role of constitutional courts in various countries. The stories of Asian courts, the South American courts, the African courts, including South Africa, the European Court of Human Rights, all abound with expansive readings of rights, from rights of personhood to equal opportunities to right to know and the transparency in governance environmental rights which now extend to the right against adverse impact of climate change, domestic bliss rights, if I may loftily mean it, and, sac and access to other social resources such as education, health and administration of justice, etc. To what extent governments can control cost of education or health services in the private sector and what can courts do to direct regulatory measure? Are these not pure economic decisions where all choices will be merely cost and benefit and not charity. To what extent in matters of constitutional consultative process, say between governors and governments, the right to duty scrutiny can be pressed into service. To what extent do scrutiny of the court will reach, for instance, in matters of efficiency or expedition in provision of public services? These are very important questions. Constitutions are transformative and organic not only for court's intervention, but also for citizens and governments. All of us are called upon to do this organic reading exercise. The interpretive role of the courts is, however, seen as the active and integral limb of governance enhancement. Is there an issue in calling courts as governance enhancers? The answer can be both yes and no. There are voices who see the demand of greater space for courts, elevates judicial reasoning to the state of the public philosophy of mind, I intend to disagree with certain statements. Particularly, I have in mind Professor Michael Sandel, who seemed to criticize the 20th century US Supreme Court for enacting novel notions of individual rights and judicial power, undermining citizenship and communal moral understanding. Similar articulations are almost abound in many literature now. These dilemmas, I say, are old wines in new bottles. Some are legitimate apprehensions in the sense that there can be nothing like a linear or unidirectional jurisprudential path for the courts. It is for these reasons, namely the uncertainties, vacillation and subjectivities inherent in the functioning of all institutions that it can be properly said that the role of the courts in constitutionalizing rights can tend to be a political process and to be tread cooperatively. Robert Alexey, in a recent work, Law's Ideal Dimension, argues for the following thesis. Quote, in an ideal democracy, the democratic process would always show sufficient respect for 
constitutional rights. There would be, in principle, no conflict between democracy and constitutional rights. In a real democracy, however, there is conflict. The reality of political life together with the idea of human and, constitution, and constitutional rights, therefore, requires constitutional review. Constitutional review claims to be closer than the parliament to the ideal dimensions of law. Very important thought to be pursued. He talks about the legal discourse in a democracy, constitutional state as a special case of general practical discourse. The moral, ethical, pragmatic contents of a practical discourse in the community will yield to legal discourses being conditioned by statute, precedent, legal doctrines, and what Habermas talks about, the unrestrained space of reason, where the judge is free to discover her own reasons. The problematic independence of the sphere of this reason needs further probe. Legal reasoning, I think, is attitudinal and moral reasoning. One moral versus the other, one value against another. It is not mathematical, not purely objective. The lines between objectivity and neutrality are often blurred in legal reasoning. We are asked to close our eyes to the tension between finality and infallibility. Today, no matter of economic or public policy can be tested on conventional administrative law principles. Many governmental decisions in financial and economic transactions arrangements or, or international transactions, etc., are based on subtle balancing factors of international relationships. The global political scene is both volatile and disguised. The clashes between free economic sphere and state control spheres will continue to exist till the synthesis is arrived at. Sectarian national interests will continue to drive global activities. Courts will be slow in peeping into the search for being in right in these spheres. We are impressed and persuaded by the appeal of courts to progress in, in human transactions relationships and closing our doors in to, de to demeaning or devaluing human tendencies and conduct. This appeal is ultimately a vote by some minds for some reasons legitimized by the institutional process. How do we construct the power to draw lines of demarcation between social powers of governance and justice powers of courts? I understand that this con construction will be like raising a building with many stories consistent with a search for being in right, always ensuring that the foundations are not weakened, lest the building becomes a Tower of Babel. The nearest Einsteinian equation we can draw by maybe justice J is equal to infallibility multiplied by finality divided by the search for truth and being in right. That is, J is equal to I multiplied by F divided by S of T R. Finally, we will be witnessing many conflicts between decisions and choices of action people may make and by governments. Balancing the seemingly opposites in life and law will thus be an increasing challenge in doing justice. Every day we hear the courts talking about balancing. Proportionality is considered as a tool in balancing. I think this balancing norm is basically an arrangement to present the opposites, but the final result will be subjective and a choice. The recent view of the Supreme Court on obligation of the government to provide against the adverse impacts of climate change, which we say is a right, versus the duty to ensure preservation of endangered species, such as the great Indian bustard, is a classic example of the balancing task. If the courts were to go beyond the two approaches to two different, uh, two different tasks and to create or devise a third approach, it can be in the unrestrained sphere of public reason. And this can be best achieved by triggering governmental and social responsibilities. All of this makes us ask a question. Is there a need for a new theory of justice administration beyond Marx, Machiavelli, and Montesquieu? And whether Madbury versus Madison need a restatement for being in the real search for truth and being in right. The very act of search for being in right takes us to a seat in others' hearts. Justice Ayer would have said, colonization of minds by force or coercion is adharma. I began my talk with observations against political, social, or institutional coercive occupations of minds. All untruths 
or coercive occupations of minds. Let me conclude with what I wrote about Gus Iyer when he laid his mortal coils. When the sun wakes up every morn, it rushes to see and greet those born as messengers of love and justice. All planets of far and near stand in queue and wave their flags in chorus great. You stand there tall and unbending, and with every breath you inhaled tales of understanding, with every breath you exhaled came tales of compassion. I wish to believe in reincarnation and karmic past, only to know the magic of your lives all past, and to script the secret of your genetic walls. My fingers fold in reference, my heart beats loud in music. You are 100 years of humanity's wealth, not to be encased in fragile holes, but to be absorbed. Your mortal coils with reluctant resolve bade your freedom to choose your destinies of favored ends. The wealth that you earned is far removed from the dialogue of bank walls. The wealth that you gave is not a fleeting legal discourses. In the long line of discerning minds and of angels of love, your spotless figure stands, I prostrate. My peep into your silent journey of paths unknown is not a farewell, a farewell of final sorts. Let learned men of law proclaim of what they glean from your words of subtle meaning and splendorous hints on compassionate lexicon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Venkata Ramani, for such an insightful lecture. It's always so wonderful to hear from you. I also warmly welcome Honorable Mr. Justice K.V. Viswanathan, Judge, Supreme Court of India. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we proceed, I invite our honorable guest to please pay the floral tribute to Honorable Justice V.R. Krishna Iyer and the lighting of the lamp. I invite Mr. R. Venkata Ramani and Mrs. Venkata Ramani, Honorable Judges of the Supreme Court, Dr. Ashwin Fernandez, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, and Professor Dabiro Sridhar Patnayak. We will now have Honorable Judges of the Supreme Court sharing their reflections on Justice V.R. Krishna Iyer's life and contribution. To begin with, I invite Honorable Mr. Justice Suryakant, Judge Supreme Court of India, to please share his reflections. My brother Justices, Justice Manullah, Justice Viswanathan, of course Justice C.T. Ravi Kumar, because of his preoccupation, has left. Honorable uh, Mr. Justice A.K. Sikri, former judge of the Supreme Court, learned attorney general, honorable judges of the Delhi High Court and other high courts, a very distinguished audience of senior advocates, jurists, members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen. I had on two occasions uh, got an opportunity to speak about uh, Justice Krishna Iyer. Last year, 
just this Krishna Iyer Memorial Society, which organized the annual lecture, they gave me this opportunity to speak about him. A very analytical and deep study of the jurisprudential growth made by Justice Krishna Iyer as a judge firstly of the Kerala High Court and then the Supreme Court of India and how it has impacted the society has been very well explained by learning attorney general in his speech of the day. I won't like to comment on that. On the question of reflections, I thought that let us first see the certain principles which Justice Krishna Iyer evolved and how those have become an indelible and inseparable part of the constitutional morality, the liberty principles, whether it is the meaning of Article 21, whether the rights of the prisoners, the rights of the downtrodden, have notes, and of a common man. Why Justice Krishna here became Masiha of the masses, I am using the word for him, is also need to be understood by us. He was a unique personality who, post-independence in 1948, suffered imprisonment. He was jailed. 1952, he became a public representative when he was elected to the Madras Legislative Assembly as an independent candidate. 1957, he repeated his victory and became a minister. As a minister, the portfolios besides the home, he also got the jail reforms. And I think here started the conflict between the power he held as a minister and the common man sitting inside him who had first-hand experience of the miseries in jail, which he himself had suffered. And if I am correct, in understanding the brief historical part of the events, there was a difference of opinion and he gave up that ministry only because Justice Krishna here as a minister could not succeed in certain reforms which he wanted to bring in prison system. But then he was eventually elevated as a judge. Then 1973, as a reforms which he recommended as a member of the Law Commission and eventually then he, when he comes to Supreme Court, the judgments which he delivered one after the other. It's very difficult to explain all his judgments or uh, even the historical judgments which he delivered in a short time of 10 minutes. But with reference to the reflections, I started recollecting myself today that how Justice Krishna here impacted on me as a judge. Maybe that I also started my journey as a common man from a rural background, then I came to high court, succeeded in profession, became an advocate general and then as a judge at a quite young age. But that impact of the judgments which you carry with you ultimately is bound to reflect. I got an opportunity to deal with a matter and where I didn't find any judicial precedent as far as the Indian courts are concerned. 
that was a case Jasveer Singh versus State of Punjab, it's a reported judgment in High Court. The issue arose that whether the convicts and that too, when one of the person had been convicted to death sentence and his wife to life imprisonment, whether they can be granted the right to conjugal visits and whether the right to progeny or the right to conjugal visits should be read into Article 21 of the Constitution. In the judgment, I dealt with Sunil Batra 1, Sunil Batra 2 and various other judgments, but importantly relying upon Sunil Batra 1 and Sunil Batra 2 and of course one more judgment by the US court that was also a recent judgment in those days with regard to decrowding of the California jail. I eventually upheld that right to conjugal visits has to be read into Article 21 as an integral part. That judgment I treat as a tribute to the great legendary Justice Krishna Iyer because it was only that his jurisprudential philosophy that impacted me to deliver that view. I got another opportunity when I was presiding a full bench in the High Court where the question of right to victims arose and that too after the 2009 amendment in the CRPC and various High Courts were taking conflicting views whether the amendment with reference to the rights of the victims to be read with a narrow meaning or it is to be construed as an expensive meaning. And there again I depended upon the principles evolved by Justice Krishna here and in full bench I laid down that the time has come we should also recognize the rights of the victims. I said the legislative intentment is to give them expensive rights, their right to be heard, we cannot no longer compel them to sit, out, sit outside the court and they have a right to be heard at different stages of the proceedings. Fortunately, my view was eventually after two, three dissenting views and some uh, deviation, but eventually my view was upheld by the Supreme Court. After coming to Supreme Court, of course, I got an opportunity in Lakhimpur Kheri's case to retreat my view and there, of course, I had to be in Supreme Court as we, in a given situation, invoke our pass under Article 142, which, of course, I didn't have at the time when I was dealing High Court. I have again tried to enforce that right of the victim, again laying down a very expensive meaning to that right. And I must fairly say that while even expanding the meaning to the victim's right also, the principles evolved by Justice Krishna here have really impacted. One more instance I, I, I must uh, uh, share with you, all of you. In High Court, a matter came before me where the two parts were, uh, there were, it was a very small civil dispute as it was looking to be. But eventually I found that here is a case where the mother of four girl children and all three were minor, four girls, they were minor. Their mother had been murdered. Their father was found guilty of committing murder. He had been sentenced, convicted under 302. And a very valuable land owned by their father was being transferred and sold in a very clandestine manner by prejudicing and compromising the rights of the minor girls. They were not party to the suit, they were not aware. Their maternal uncle was also not aware of anything. But incidentally it happened that the, the facts while arguing the matter, the facts emerged before me. It's a very lengthy story I am not going to share because that will take long time. But eventually I restored the rights of those girls to that property, appointed the deputy commissioner as the receiver of the land, 
it was to be auctioned annually. The children were got admitted in school. Their education was guaranteed. I directed the state government to provide some social security, scholarships, free education. Other certain rights were granted to the girls. Eventually, when I delivered that judgment, I developed a concept of invisible victims of the system. And first time in 2015, in Kerala, after 2014 demise of Justice Krishna here, there was a Commonwealth conference in Kerala, and there on a platform I raised this issue that time has come, the judiciary should also now think of protecting and promoting and preserving the rights of invisible victims of the system. Not many people were receptive of the idea, but Professor Medhavman stood up and he said what the judge is saying carries a lot of weight and we must consider that. Eventually, a session was devoted on this subject and I'm quite sure that in due course of time, we will get an opportunity to develop the concept of the victim, invis invisible victims of the system, whether it is society, whether a judicial system. There also, in, when I raised this issue, I relied upon certain observations made by Justice Krishna here in some of his landmark judgments. I feel that the Indian jurisprudence will continue to grow under the umbrella, under the guidance, under the following the principles and promoting the liberty, the human rights, the constitutional guarantees and constitutional morality which Justice Krishna here continue to serve, promote and project. I think that is what as a judge we feel a very satisfying experience in life. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. My esteemed and uh, respected elder brother, Honorable Justice Surikant, my dear brother Justice Amanullah, Justice Sikri, then an Attorney General for India, and if I can disclose the secret, I don't know how many know, the birthday boy, <laughs> Mr. Venkatramani, Mrs. Vijayalakshmi Venkatramani, <laughs> Honorable Judges of the Delhi High Court, Mr. Rajkumar, the Vice Chancellor, the Jindal Global University, esteemed professors, distinguished senior advocates, distinguished lawyers, ladies and gentlemen, very good evening to you all. At the outset, let me congratulate the learned Attorney General for a, an outstanding lecture. Though because of the Indo-Singapore uh, AI conference, of which the learned Attorney General also attended in the morning, uh, I was a part and that concluded late. I missed the first part. I did catch up with the uh, brochure and heard a good part of your lecture. It's a great tribute. It's a wonderful gesture that on your birthday, without disclosing, you chose to have a lecture in honor of somebody whom all of us admire. And we all know that you admire Justice Krishna in great measure. It's a wonderful tribute. And thank you for uh, inviting me to share my reflections. I had some years back, uh, uh, you know, after giving a little thought as to what marks Justice Krishnayar out from the rest, pent a small piece, so by and large the nucleus of today's uh, talk would be drawn from that. But before that, I just want to share a, a personal uh, anecdotes, a couple of them, one at the very outset. A pilgrimage to Sad Gamaya, the residence of Justice Iyer at Kochi, ought to be a memorable one for one and all. So it was in my case. I dropped in around 4 p.m. on the March of 2006. Barely had I entered, I realized that Justice Iyer, who was then uh, 91, had had a flurry of hectic activity in the house. The whole of that morning, he had put together a group of small children and drawn up a children manifesto, 
setting out as to what the plan of action should be for the children of India for the next 50 years. Now you realize why Justice Krishnair is so different from most of the rest of us. He was thinking 50 years ahead. Justice Iyer has always been far ahead of his times. Oceans of ink and reams of paper have already illuminated his illustrious career through his multifaceted activities. I do not propose to conduct what Justice Matthew would call an idle parade of familiar learning. Two, two crucial aspects of Justice Iyer's life as a judge have fascinated me and continue to fascinate me. Noted uh, jurist, recently we lost him, Sri Fali Nariman in his monograph, The Judiciary and the Role of the Pathfinders had the following to say on Justice Ayer. Quote, he often strayed from the beaten path of the law, spinning in his own cocoon of jurisprudence. Even when he was writing a majority judgment, he made a provision, as in a minority opinion, for the brood brooding spirit of the future. First of the two facets is actually picturized by Mr. Nariman. Why do we say that? It is common knowledge that lawmakers resort to neutralizing judgments by passing validation acts. It's, a, it's an appropriate and a recognized tool. Prithivi Cotton would come to mind that they can remove the basis of the judgment without neutralizing a mandamus. But look what has happened in the case of Justice Krishnayar's judgments. Quite apart from neutralizing the verdict, they have gone ahead and enacted legislation to bring in force his judgments. Look at the difference. Far from neutralizing and validating a law, they enact legislation not once, not twice, but I have counted three reinforcing his pronouncements. And what are those cases? In Indian Performing Rights Society versus Eastern India Motion Pictures, the 1977 judgment, the famous uh, one on um, copyright, the question was about the composer's right to a copyright in a soundtrack as opposed to the right of the producer. Keeping the then existing legislative provisions, the court ruled for the producer. Justice Krishnaya wrote a concurring judgment, which he called a footnote, and in it said the following, quote, strangely enough, author as defined in section 2D in relation to a musical work is only the composer, and section 16 confines copyright to those works which are recognized by the act. This means that the composer alone has copyright in a musical work, the singer has none. This disentitlement of the musician or group of musical artists to copyright is un-Indian because the major attraction which lends monetary value to a musical performance is not the music maker so much as the musician. Perhaps both deserve to be recognized by the copyright law. I make this observation only because art in one sense depends on the ethos and the aesthetic best of a people. And while universal protection of intellectual and aesthetic property of creators of works is an international obligation, each country in its law must protect such rights wherever originality is contributed. So viewed, apart from the music composer, the singer must be conferred a right. Of course, lawmaking is the province of parliament where the court, court must communicate to the lawmaker such infirmities as exist in the law. What happens? Though it took considerable time, it took about 35 years, the Copyright Amendment of 2012 stepped in by introducing an amendment to Section 17, which gives effect to the clairvoyant appeal of Justice Krishnaya. Not only this, the Environment Protection Act came in 1986. In 1980, Justice Krishnaya was faced with the Ratla municipality case, known as the Vardi Chand versus the Ratla municipality. Look at uh, what happened. Justice Ayya, through his pronouncement, again laid down the pathway for legislative change in the form of enactment of the Environment Protection Act. How did he do that? He looked around, he saw a provision in the Code of Criminal Procedure for abatement of nuisances, caught hold of it, 
developed on it, the court was faced with a question relating to the power of the court to compel the municipal authority by way of affirmative action to take steps to address problems of sanitation in the municipal area. Justice Krishnair examined the framework of law as it then existed under which court could direct such action to be taken by the municipal authorities and stressed upon the need for exercise of the powers under the statutory framework for imparting social justice to people by insisting on maintenance of clean environment. The legislative steps to have a more structured legal framework in the area of environment protection finally culminated into a legislation, the Environment Protection Act of 1986 and the Municipal Solid Waste Management and Handling Rules of 2000. Speaking for the court in 1980 in Vardichan, Justice Krishnayar said, public nuisance because of pollutants being discharged by big factories to the detriment of the poorer section is a challenge to the social justice component of the rule of law. Now we saw copyright, we saw uh, environment, but look at uh, in the arena of criminal jurisprudence. It is always believed that criminal law is skewed in favor of the accused. For Justice Aya, nothing could be farther from truth. In Sadanandam versus Arunachalam, a famous case where he gave leave to appeal for a, a, a complainant witness to appeal against an acquittal when the state had not appealed. Justice Iyer took note of the compelling reasons for allowing a private individual to challenge an order of acquittal in the Supreme Court under Article 136 of the Constitution and indicated the need for giving such liberty to a complainant to file appeal against an acquittal order. Picking up the thread, Parliament's legislative reform came in the year 2009 by way of enactment of an amendment to Section 372 of the Code of Criminal Procedure which added a proviso to the section permitting a victim to file an appeal against an order of the trial court acquitting the accused or convicting for a lesser offense or imposing inadequate compensation. The above are just a few illustrations to demonstrate that Justice Aya has been a torch bearer, a pioneer, a driver for legislative and social change, a one-man pressure group who gave direction for policy change. He had so thoroughly mastered the theory, science and grammar of law that when a problem presented itself, he was able to view it from a totally different pedestal and articulate a correct and a permanent solution which ordinary mortals could not. This is why he was different and that is what marks him out as a precious jewel. While he singled himself out for special treatment even at the hands of the legislature, by the sheer force of his judgment, there is another illustrious aspect, his style of judgment writing. If words are a vehicle for conveying thoughts, Justice Krishnayar always rode a Rolls Royce. Lord Denning, talking of lawyers with knowledge of literature and those without, said that while the former was like an architect, the latter was just a mason. But Justice Krishnayar was not just about law and English literature. He had a literature of his own. Let us sever a few. It is only recently that the Supreme Court dealing with the death penalty cases ruled that inordinate delay in disposal of mercy petitions will result in commutation of death penalty since it was a serious infringement to the petitioner's right under Article 21. Triveni Ben, when I say recently, you know, the, the late uh, 90s, towards the early 90s. Hold your breath and see how the seeds of it were sown Many years back, in the first Sunil Batra case, which uh, uh, both uh, uh, Honorable Justice Surikant and uh, Mr. Venkat Ramani referred to, when in the following powerful and telling words, Justice Iyer stated, quotation, the safekeeping in jail custody is the limited jurisdiction of the jailer. The convict is not sentenced to imprisonment. He is not sentenced to solitary confinement. He is a guest in custody in the safekeeping of the host jailer until the terminal hour of terrestrial farewell whisks him away to the halter. This is trusteeship in the hands of the superintendent, not imprisonment in the true sense. Section 366.2 of the Criminal Procedure Code and Form 40 underscore this concept, reinforced by the absence of a sentence of imprisonment under Section 53, read with Section 73 of the Indian Penal Code. The inference is inevitable that if the condemned men were harmed by physical or mental torture, the law would not tolerate the doing since injury and safety 
our obvious enemies. The one particularly favorite passage of mine, I quote it from memory whenever I get a chance, explaining the Indian constitutional model of governance and how its structure is more akin to the British Westminster model and not the American model, Justice Ayer eloquently said in Shamsher Singh, quotation, not the Potomac, but the Thames fertilizes the flow of the Yamuna if we may adopt a riverine imagery. In this thesis, we are fortified by a precedence of this court, strengthened by constituent assembly proceedings and reinforced by the actual working of the organs involved for about a silver jubilee span of time. Quotation close. Words simply etch the concept in the reader's mind for it to say, stay there permanently. Now, by that passage, the reader has had a virtual tour of Washington, D.C., the Potomac, and London for the Thames, and New Delhi for the Yamuna, in all of two lines. Every time one reads a judgment or an article of Justice Krishnayar, one is left in absolute bewilderment at the vast expanse of knowledge possessed by him. Chief Justice Hidayatullah, himself a legal giant, while describing the great Sir Aladi Kishwamiyaya, mentions that Aladi was sure-footed while traversing the thickets of law. Justice Krishnayar leaves you with the very same feeling. Now, to end on a personal note, I was overjoyed when uh, my esteemed senior, Mr. Venugopal, for a function in their family, put me as the minister in waiting for Justice Krishnayar. My only duty was to receive him at the Madras airport, put him in the hotel, go to him 15 minutes before the function, take Justice Krishnayar onto the lift, get him in the car, and I, uh, that's a memorable moment. During my interaction, I was pleasantly surprised to know that my late grandfather, Sri K.R. Vishwanath Ayer, a leading lawyer, then a renowned lawyer, had, uh, had briefed and worked with Justice Krishnaya, then a renowned lawyer in the district courts, and they had handled matters together. Justice Krishnaya mentioned a few cases and spoke in uh, glowing terms. Uh, so it's a great opportunity that you have given me, uh, Mr. Rajkumar and the Attorney General, to share my reflections on uh, Justice Krishnaya. I think uh, it's a constant uh, inspiration. Uh, of course, at the bar, since he retired on 15th November 1980, uh, we didn't have any occasion to appear before him, but read of him, read about him, heard about him. And post-retirement, I uh, interacted with him. So we cherish those moments, and uh, it's a wonderful evening that has been organized. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Mr. Justice K.V. Viswanathan, for sharing your wonderful reflections. We will now move on to the second part of this very special evening. I invite Dr. Ashwin Fernandez, Executive Director, QS Quacarelli Simmons, UK, to please introduce the QS World University Rankings by Subject 2024. It is uh, with great honor and uh, privilege that I stand before you today on this momentous occasion of the Justice V.R. Krishna Iyer Memorial Lecture. As we gather here, we are reminded of the transformative power of education. Education is not merely about acquiring knowledge, it is about nurturing minds, fostering critical thinking, and igniting a passion for lifelong learning. This day is special, not just for the lecture, but it also comes close on the heels of the recently announced QS World University Rankings by subject. This year is a landmark milestone for India, as it tops the list of G20 nations in the most encouraging upward trend for India's higher education institutions in the QS World University Subject Rankings, showing the G20 countries the way forward. As the host of the 2023 G20 Summit, India led the way in several discussions on global economy, being agents of change, promoting inclusivity, 
and embracing cultural diversity centered around the notion of one world, one family. And under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, education has become one of the key focal points of driving change, not just in the country, but in the way the world perceives India. And standing here today before you on the eve of Ambedkar Jayanti, I'm reminded of what Sri Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar, the chief architect of our country's constitution, has said about justice. Justice has always evoked ideas of equality, of proportion, of compensation. In short, justice is another name for liberty, equality, and fraternity. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to announce that OP Jindal Global Universities, Jindal Global Law School ranks as the number one law school in India for the fifth time in a row. It also ranks 72nd globally, making it the only law school in India to be featured amongst the top 100 of the world. <laughs> to be standing here today in the hallowed halls of the lone star law school that tops the list of law schools in a country and surpassed global institutions like the University of Nottingham, University of Texas at Austin, Waseda University, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and Boston University, among others, it is truly an honor like no other for me. The graduates of OP Jindal Global University will be catalysts for positive change, driving the cause of justice and advancing the knowledge for the betterment of society. As the Honorable Late Justice V.R. Krishna Iyer said, entire humanity in this law school is this law school's comprehensive constituency and the search for truth in its limited infinity is its supreme ambition to the faculty staff students and supporters who have contributed to the realization of this dream i extend my heartiest congratulations your dedication and commitment has laid the stone for a brighter future for the brightest legal minds in our country. Brand India is shining and shining bright, and OP Jindal Global University stands testament to this at the, as the foremost law school in the country today. I take this opportunity to present to OP Jindal Global University and to the founding vice chancellor a special commemorative plaque and a certificate to mark this occasion. Thank you very much. I now request Mr. Fernandez to please present the commemorative medal to Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, founding Vice Chancellor of the University. I also request our distinguished guests, Honorable Mr. Justice Suri Khan, Honorable Mr. Justice K.V. Viswanathan, Mr. R. Venkita Ramani, Professor Dabiru Sridhar Patnayak, Professor S.G. Srijit, Professor Padmanabha Ramanujam and Professor Deepika Jain to please join us on the days. request the Attorney General for India, Mr. R. Venkata Ramani, to please unveil the QS ranking and also release the new brochure of Jindal Global Law School. Thank you. I request the Attorney General for India to please unveil the QS ranking.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, learned members of the audience. This has been a day of surprise. What ideally would have been a normal Delhi day turned into a rainy special day. And I was supposed to be uh, the giver of introductory remarks. And again, by the mysterious turn of the fate wheel, I'm here standing before you to give the reflections of the faculty members with a speech written by way of setting a context to the speech by the learned attorney general. But yet, let me make an effort. One cannot talk about Justice Krishnayar without being existentialist in tone. And Professor Rajkumar set the ball rolling by way of an existentialist statement by Paulo Colo that when you dream something, the whole universe has space for you. If there is a probable existentialist cafe where Mario Ponti, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Simona de Boer would be there, I'm sure Justice Krishnaya would comfortably fit into that company. The topic today, it's a little bit difficult actually to summarize what the learned attorney general spoke in search of being right, citizens, governance, and the courts. Being right, in this context is the discovery of the beingness, what I could conjecture from what he spoke, within the reality of a nation called India. And that prompts me to take a phenomenological approach to being in here, in this nation as its citizen. In search of being right is in fact an existentialist search which we are all on on a routine basis. It is a persistent pursuit of the beingness in us, a persistent pursuit of the meanings that happen in our routine life, which includes me searching for the meaning of me speaking by way of an anachronism at this moment, summarizing the speech of the learned attorney general. The search of the truth, the search of the beingness, is also a search into the contours of the human self. It is the Heideggerian design awareness, we all know what does it mean to be a Dasein. Being a Dasein means we actually looking at our own existence in the material world. So looking at a photograph or looking at a mirror is an effort to find us in our own existential reality. Now, Justice Krishnayar has tried to play the role of Dasein for we, providing us reflections of our own self-image in the society. But the, the being, the Indian citizen, is constantly in search of its otherness in the civilizational wisdom, in history, in values, in religion, in class consciousness, and often in ideologies. Imagine this being, which is in, perceptual, in, 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 in perpetual pursuit of its own beingness, is the Indian citizen. Then it becomes the being that identifies itself in the democratic conditions. It searches for itself in the national values. And national values are often the welt and schwangs of the Constitution. Any being, for that matter, any Indian that internalizes themselves in these constitutional welt and schwang advances towards the sense of belonging, the sense of citizenship. It is this identification that makes the existence in a state facilitated by a government meaningful. State then no longer is the imagined community for that being. It is with the being, it belongs to the being. Justice Krishnayar, Dasein and the citizenship has a kind of a relationship. It is the Dasein SQ quality of the Indian citizens that Justice Krishnayar tried to discover through his judgments. He explored and expounded the same in his judgments. He believed in the Zaidgeist and helped the citizens to discover themselves in this spirit. By way of achieving the same, he practiced what Justice Hidayatullah calls the yoga of the public law. And Justice Krishnaya himself echoed the sentiment, the Indian constitution is a social naidus, a spiritual appetizer, a super legal parchment. For this, the rediscovery of the being, and to help the Indian citizens find its own beingness, Justice Krishnaya used the courts as a means. The court for Justice Krishnaya is a means for enculturation. The court through its judgments, help the being grasp its beingness in a cultural assemblage. Cultural assemblage. That many a times required in a Shakespearean vein. Words, words, words. 
words, 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 words. And that's exactly what Justice Krishna here did. He used the possibility of the language to, to provide an alternative reality to the world. He explored the possibilities of the words, the possibilities of the language, using the various contexts that were presented to him in the form of Sunil Badra, B.S. Shukla, Gudikanti Narasim Hulu. His wordsmithery produced alternative realities as his readers, whosoever, labored through the lexicons, they found an alternative reality forming within them and also an alternative reality forming outside of them. The learned attorney general created a tripod here, the tripod of citizens, governance, and the courts, and to look at the search, of the, search for being right. In being right, in actualizing the beingness of the Indian citizen. Well, that's by way of an existentialist phenomenological take on the search of being right. Now, if I believe in this existentialist reality we saw in the evening, at some point, it looked like this event would not happen. And then the rain subsided, Attorney General started to speak, and we heard the bird songs of thrush, warblers, and the flycatchers, and the chime of bells, perhaps from a temple nearby. Perhaps that, if you believe in a mystic wisdom, when it rains, it means that the soul makes its presence felt. Probably that Justice Krishnaya was here with us, listening to us, seeing his own words turning into a self his own words about Jindal Global Law School and Obi Jindal Global University turning into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Srijit. I could not agree more with you. I now invite Professor Deepika Jain, Vice Dean, Jindal Global Law School, to please address the audience. Good evening. Having been with this institution since its inception as a founding faculty member, I've occupied various roles and uh, positions of leadership at the law school. I'd like to emphasize three key characteristics of this institution, which I consider my academic home to be what it makes for a university to be a true university. Firstly, since its inception, the institution has had a very clear investment in research and innovative pedagogical freedom, crucial for both early career scholars and established scholars. This commitment is evident through dedicated time to research, resources dedicated towards sabbaticals, research funding, research grants, freedom to design electives, which align with our research interest, opportunities for workshops and conferences, fostering intellectual collaborations and academic networking. The institution is also dedicated to pedagogical innovation, constantly seeking new ways to enhance teaching effectiveness while respecting critical thought. The second one is on gen gender diversity. From its inception, the institution has upheld equal opportunities for everyone, a principle now ingrained in our HR policies. This commitment to diversity is reflected in our faculty and student body. For example, we are, at the moment, 56% of our faculty is occupied by women. Finally, a commitment to social justice, which I am personally invested in. We take pride in our commitment to social justice exemplified by our unique approach to clinical legal education inspired by Justice Iyer. We are one of the few institutions in the country to employ full-time clinical faculty to exclusively dedicated time with a very small number of students to engage with critical engagement on law and social justice. These faculty members, along with our student attorneys, student paralegals, volunteers, and communities engage in vital projects, including advocacy for under trial prisoners, trans justice, eco justice, and child rights, among others. Reflecting on our collective journey within this institution fills me with immense pride and gratitude. Over the years, we've done more than just establish an academic community. We've nurtured a haven for ideas intellectual development, and the pursuit of social justice. We've empowered many young minds to dream, to realize their dreams, to believe in their ability, to heal the world, to, to think alternatively, and we have learned from our students as faculty. As I stand here today, I'm reminded of the many instances of teamwork, 
inspiration, and personal growth that has characterized our time together. Thank you all for being a part of this wonderful journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Deepika Jain. Finally, I request Professor Padmanabh Ramanujam, Dean, Office of Academic Governance, OP Jindal Global University, to please address the audience. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, very articulatively, Srijit has captured the lectures and Deepika has told about the law school. I just thought I'll take one minute or less than one minute in telling you why we are so proud that we are number one law school and also 72nd law school in the world. And I just thought it would be nice to uh, give you some data because data speaks volume. Um, this year is very special uh, as we are moving uh, from strength to strength. We were 84th law school last year and we have moved 12 uh, ranks above. And the most important thing is we have surpassed some of the institutions and I just wanted to call out those institutions. Along with that, we also made a small research how old these institutions were. University of Nottingham, we surpassed, and it is an institution which is 140 years old. University of Texas and Austin, which is 140 years old. George Washington University, we surpassed, which is 200 years old. Nyanyang Technology University, which is 50 years old. Waseda, which is 140 years old. Boston, which is 180 years old. Shanghai Geotong, which is 125 years old. University of Vienna, which is 650 years old. University of Geneva, which is 450 years old. It is very important to pause here and just understand that we are actually in reality, Jindal Global Law School is just 15 years old. This is the journey. And you know the reason why I'm talking about this data is we should dream, and now it is a time not to be complacent, and we need to build strength on strength, and we want to march towards the next journey of becoming the top 50 law schools in the world. And I really wanted to uh, congratulate our Vice Chancellor and the entire faculty of JGLS. This is a time to celebrate, but tomorrow is a time for us to work hard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. As we come to an end to today's program, I invite Professor Dabiru Sridhar Patnayak, Registrar, OP Jindal Global University, to please share the concluding remarks. Thank you very much, uh, and good evening, everyone. I know it's been a long evening, but it's certainly an eventful evening, and on behalf of the OP Jindal Global University, I must share with you all how honored we are uh, to commemorate this uh, evening with uh, Justice V.R. Krishna here, uh, memorial lecture. We are indeed so very grateful to uh, Justice Ayer uh, for his guidance and support uh, during the early years or uh, during the gestation period of the Jindal Global Law School of the OP Jindal uh, Global University. We are fortunate that we could stand on his shoulders and we could look afar towards the clear sky and it's been an incredible journey uh, thus far. So we are grateful to uh, the learned Attorney General Mr. Venkatramani, uh, for the erudite lecture and for inviting all of us here and for hosting all of us here this evening. We are also thankful to the honorable justices, Justice Surya Kant, Justice C.T. Ravi Kumar, and Justice K.V. Vishwanathan, judges of the Supreme Court of India, for sparing their time and for sharing their uh, reflections on Justice V.R. Krishna Iyer's life and contributions. We are also uh, thankful to the QS uh, for the worthy recognition. Uh, this only makes our task more onerous and we will continue to offer quality legal education and quality higher education benchmark against the top universities around the world. We are grateful to all our stakeholders uh, and friends of the university uh, who attended this evening this lecture and the program, but for your support we would not have traveled this far and we are thankful to each and every one. The time is so limited, I may not have the opportunity uh, to take the names of each and every individual, uh, but we are thankful to one and all, and I might have missed a few individuals and institutions for which I might be forgiven, but without you, we wouldn't have existed, and we are grateful to one and all once again. The program has ended, and we invite each one of you to join us for dinner. 
Thank you so much.